Good evening. And welcome to the General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen of the City of New York and to the ninth season of our Audison Lectures. I am Karen Taylor, Program Director of the General Society, and we're so pleased that you could all be here this evening. This program is supported in part by public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council. I would also like to express our appreciation to Thomas Donahue, um, who created a special window display for tonight's talk. The General Society was founded in 1785. And actually, just as a matter of interest, how many of you here this evening, is this your first visit? Great, well, a very warm welcome. Um, so I'm gonna give you a little bit of background. Uh, we were founded, as I said, in 1785 by the Seals Craftsmen of New York City. And we were founded by artisans, hence the Artisan Lecture Series. And these artisans represented 22 different trades. These included blacksmith, goldsmith, tailors, and saddlers, shipbuilders, and today, our 234-year-old organization continues to serve the people of the city of New York through our educational and cultural programs. These include the General Society Library, of which you're in this evening, our John M. Mossman Lock Museum, which you can see upstairs, and you're welcome to go and have a look afterwards, and our tuition-free Mechanics Institute. And finally, our nearly 200-year-old lecture series, of which tonight's program is, of course, part of. Our speaker tonight is Tim Olpau. Tim Olpau is a carpenter and artisan, as well as being the author of the historical fiction novel Claret Dreams. He specializes in creating handcrafted divot tools, trestle sticks for golf bags, and hickory club restorations. And some of you may have seen some of his beautiful work on the table at the front of the room. He's a student of both golf history and golf architecture. Tonight, Mr. Old Pau will talk about the restoration of hickory golf clubs and the crafting of divot tools. It is my great pleasure to introduce to you Al Pau, Tim Al Pau to you, Tim. Thank you, Karen. Thanks to the society and thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for being here this evening and allowing me the privilege of sharing my passion with you for two things, the design and fabrication of handcrafted divot tools and the restoration of late 19th century and early 20th century hickory shafted golf clubs. Um, I've heard it said that if you work with your hands, you are a laborer. And if you work with your hands and your head, you're a craftsman. But if you work with your hands and your head and your heart, you're an artisan. Um, the ability to take a general object and convert it into a working piece of art is a blessing and something that um, I don't take for granted. Um, when Karen was introducing me, I could feel the butterflies well up inside. I uh, spend a good deal of my time in my workshop and uh, I rarely get to talk in public to groups this big. The last time I spoke to a group this size was at my daughter's wedding a couple of years ago. <laughs> Um, but I've heard advice from friends of mine as to how to deal with the nervousness of public speaking. So rest assured that I'm not looking at all of you and picturing you in your underwear. Uh, instead, I'm reflecting on, a pos on an opportunity when I had every reason to be nervous, uh, but I got through it. Um, for the average golfer, being invited to the first tee of the old course at St. Andrews is a nerve-wracking experience. Um, golf writer George Pepper called it nature's greatest laxative. And, uh, but five years ago, there I stood on the first tee 
and uh, along with the starter and three other players, and they were all holding their 460cc behemoth drivers, anxiously pacing back and forth, waiting to play. And I reached into my bag and pulled out uh, my state-of-the-art 1912 Brassy, which I had faithfully restored and which hadn't seen active duty in about 80 years. And when you play hickory golf with people who are playing modern golf, you can literally hear their eyes roll back in their head as they say, oh, here goes the next five hours of my life wasted by this Scottish version of a Civil War reenactor slogging along with his grandfather's relics. Um, and then the next most nervous thing is when the starter says, gentlemen, play away. And there's this ritualistic dance of avoidance where people retie their shoes or go back to their bag to get another tee or mark their ball, anything to avoid being the first one to embarrass themselves in front of the other three gentlemen and the four people waiting to tee off next. But uh, it's always been my philosophy that um, one of two things will happen. You'll hit the ball well, and everyone will congratulate the ball and say, nice ball. And, or you'll do what uh, Harry Varden said, and you'll hit a foozle. And uh, there's this quiet head hanging, and there but for the grace of God, God go I kind of response from everybody else. So I grab my square mesh golf ball and my handcrafted hickory tee and stuck them in the ground, took my brassy out, gave it a little waggle, tried to channel my best Harry Varden, drew the club back as slowly and syrupy as I could and took my swing. The ball shot off and uh, karma allowed it to go about eyeball high, 220 yards down the fairway. It hit the fescue and bounded another 45 yards or so. And I turned around to see three grown men standing there like this, <laughs> with these giant drivers, and the starter with a grin from ear to ear, as if he was just offered a second serving of haggis at Burns Night. So um, by a show of hands, how many golfers do we have here this evening? This is wonderful. So you can tell me what these are. Divot tools, also called ball mark repair tools and pitch mark repair tools. And basically, divots are something you replace or fill with sand. You rarely re repair them, but the moniker has stuck with these um, forever, or since I guess the 50s when I first have a history of, of them being in existence. Um, the divot itself dates back to 1530 Scotland, when they would take a large clump of grass about this big and collect a couple hundred of them and shingle a house with them. And uh, it wasn't until 300 years later when a club like this came into existence that someone probably took a big chunk out of the old course and his playing partner said, uh, that's a wee bonny divot, Malcolm, a couple hundred more and I can roof my house with it. <laughs> but we have a lot to, of, to thank the Scots for with regard to um, golf and other things. Probably first most on the list would be single malt. By show of hands, how many single malt drinkers do we have? Perhaps I'm talking about the wrong subject tonight. <clears throat> but they also gave us the game of golf. And while the game of golf had predecessors and ancestors going back to the French, the Chinese, the Roman Empire, they played a game with a curved stick and a ball, but they really didn't hit it into a hole. It was only the Scots who decided to hit it into a hole that developed the game of golf as we know it today. And, um, The, Scots, the Scottish wool merchants traveled up to Holland to sell their wool, and they noticed a game of Kolf, K-O-L-F, being played on the frozen canals up in, Scot up in Holland. And they came back, and since there weren't a ton of, of frozen canals in Scotland, they decided to use 
the lynx land, which is the non-arable piece of, of turf between the farmland and the sea. And when you hear people say, let's hit the lynx, that's where that expression came from. Um, the lynx land was pretty much the domain of rabbits and sheep. And the rabbits would build warrens, and the holes to their warrens were about this big around, and that became the golf hole. They would urinate on the grass outside their hole to mark their territory, killing the grass and making our first putting greens. And the sheep would burrow into the dunes to protect themselves from the elements blowing in off the water. And when they got up to graze, the sand would blow in, fill in those, and make our first bunkers. There is written evidence of golf being played on the links of Dornick as early as 1415. And then it became so popular that in 1457, King James II decreed that golf and football, or soccer, is uh, illegal because it interfered with a much needed archery practice to defend the realm. And then in 1502, the Treaty of Glasgow was signed and it meant peace and perpetuity between Scotland and England. And King James IV, grandson of King James II, also King James the party pooper, um, decreed golf back in action, ran out and bought himself a set of golf clubs, and golf has been played in Scotland since 1502. Mary, Queen of Scots, was one of the first female golfers, and she, um, she was in Paris playing, and she used young cadets, or cadets, to carry her clubs, and that gave birth to the name of our caddies today. Probably the only other thing that I'm truly grateful to the Scots for is uh, sticky toffee pudding. A little bit about myself. I graduated from the University of Scranton in 1980 with a major in accounting and minors in economics, philosophy, theology, and English literature. Took a job with Coopers and Libran, which is now part of PricewaterhouseCoopers. And after three years, I left and joined um, public domain as, uh, with C.R. Bard. And uh, in 1987, as the vice president of SEC reporting for a financing subsidiary of manufacturers Hanover, I passed the law and auditing parts of the CPA exam, went in the next morning, and promptly quit my job. Bought a van, bought some tools, and started to be a carpenter and uh, have never been happier. Um, having your name on your van allows you to uh, play a lot more golf than being an accountant. And in 1992, I received a plastic divot tool like you saw in the picture before. And at the time I was working with uh, Purple Heart, which is oddly enough purple, but it's rock hard wood. And I took a piece of that and fashioned a divot tool and I went out and played, and a buddy of mine wanted one, and then another buddy wanted one. And before I knew it, I became a divot tool maker. And in 1996, I volunteered as a spotter for ESPN when the senior tour came to the Upper Montclair Country Club in uh, Clifton, New Jersey. And I was put in with Arnold Palmer's group. So I gave him one of my divot tools, and at the end of the round, I asked him if he'd be interested in having them for the President's Cup. So for those people who didn't raise their hands, the President's Cup is a biennial event that pits the greatest U.S. golfers against the greatest international golfers. And he was gracious enough to say yes, and I was invited down to the Robert Trent Jones Golf Club in Manassas, Virginia as his guest. And I gave one of my divot tools to Barbara Bush, to her husband George, who was unemployed at the time, and to President Clinton, and to Tom Kite, who had me make them for the 97 Ryder Cup team. So I came home, and the early tools looked a little like this, two-prong wood and logos. Um, I came home with a little bit of enthusiasm, went to some of the local country clubs, walked in and said, hey, can I show you my divot tool? And it was like I said, hey, can I show you a slide presentation of my parents' trip to the Grand Canyon? 
they just stared at me and, and then I said that Arnold Palmer had me make for the President's Cup. And having Arnold Palmer's endorsement is like uh, a Michelin star or the good housekeeping seal of approval. 45 minutes later, you're still talking about what a nice gentleman Arnold Palmer was, and you walk out with an order of divot tools. And so at first, the tools were single prong. I went around and I gave them out to different pros. And every time I gave one to a pro, I would have them sign one for me. And uh, I offered one to Tom Watson one day, and he said, I don't use a tool. And I thought, that's unusual. So I followed him that day, and he used a T like a sewing needle. And I said, okay. So I came home, and this was the tool that I had always been making. And one day, one of the prongs broke off. And after a few iterations, I came up with this tool. The pros loved it because of the ergonomics of it. And the superintendents loved it because it didn't have two prongs. When you put two prongs in the ground and turn it, the roots snap and you kill the grass. So the pros love this, the supers love this. And so rather than rest on my laurels, I started to make some changes. I added a couple layers of wood, changed the shape to be more streamlined, and started to laser logos. This one is Harbor Town. Um, some clubs don't require logos. I did this bottom one, and somebody sent me the Boston golf flag and said, hey, that's clever. I had no idea I did that, but it happened. I've had people contact me and say, we're having a buddy's trip to Cabot. Um, can you make tools for all, of, all the guys? I think this would be a great surprise. So I did that. Um, I tried my hand at marquetry. These are uh, yellow heart and blood wood over a core of ebony. Um, here's another example of uh, the, the second and fourth ones have little notches in the top so when you put your tool in the ground you can rest your club inside that groove and keep the handle off the wet grass. I was playing with a gentleman, a friend of mine, and he, uh, he smoked cigars four or five in a single round. And every, every time we got to the green, he'd take it out, put it on the grass, soaking wet, covered in chemicals. And so I returned and made him this divot tool, <laughs> which he bought a dozen of them, gave them out to all his cigar smoking friends. And uh, I have a buddy of mine who got married in New York State at a black tie affair. In the morning of his wedding, he had a um, bachelor party get together with all the, the groomsmen. They went out and played, had a few drinks, and prepared themselves for one of them leaving the nest. And so I made these tools for them that day. Um, I've been inspired by everything around me. Um, I watched a show on um, the Discovery Channel, or Nat Geo, and it was about dolphins. So I made these tools. Um, both to be decorative and to hold your golf club up. Uh, last year, um, in the news, they announced that pitchers and catchers were reporting for spring training. So I came up with, uh, I took golf balls, peeled the covers off, stitched these on, and made, these are hickory shafts from early 1920 clubs. People from all over send me clubs to restore. So I take them and the, the, often the shafts are broken, so I have this enormous box of broken shafts, and one day I'm looking at them saying, what can I do with those? I don't want to burn them or throw them out. And so I came up with the idea of making them into divot tools. And uh, one day I was at uh, Home Goods, and I'm walking down the aisle, and I, everything I look at, I think of it as a divot tool. So I saw four cheese knives, and they were lighthouses. So I bought the set, pulled the knives out, inserted wood, and made them into divot tools. And um, now I have people contacting me and say, can you do the one at Skankity Head? Can you do the one at Nantucket? These were in the box, that's what they get. So um, I say, if you want something that's a different color, buy some paint. Uh, I've added copper weights to them to give them warmth, so when you hold them in your hand while you're waiting to putt on those cold Irish mornings, that 
copper heats up to the temperature of your hand and keeps your hand warm. Um, it gives it a little bit of weight. I've added glass cylinders to the insides of the, of the shafts themselves to give you something to spin while you're waiting. Keep taking your mind off that four foot putt for the match. Um, I've also done combinations. The tip of this is a um, hickory shaft and it has a dowel that's been turned to the end of it. The dowel is then the handle, which is made out of coco bolo, is drilled out and that shaft, the tip is inserted in there and glued up. And then I've had people contact me and say, uh, and I hope this works, okay, that um, your tools are too big. I don't think they are, but you take their, their word for it. And so I came up with this tool on the second and fourth on the bottom, and hopefully this works. It's called a peanut, and it opens up and gives you a divot tool, then folds up and disappears back in your pocket. And for those people who, like Tom Watson, who only use a T, I took and made a tool that opens up, allows you to put a T inside, closes up, and gives you a divot tool. And um, the other thing Karen mentioned is I make trestle sticks. And trestle sticks are basically two pieces of wood fastened with a, a Chicago screw, which is a male and female screw, and fastened across the bottom with a strip of leather. And a, a guy from South Carolina contacted me and said, can you make me two of those connected with a rod so I can rest my golf bag on it when it's in my office? And I just said, it's just gonna be too unstable. So I did, went down to my workshop, scratched my head a bit, and came up with this collapsible bag stand. And it folds out of the way and goes behind your bookcase. And when you're, you're not putting that uh, McKenzie bag on the ground that's covered with chemicals because you didn't have your trestle sticks while you were out playing that day. Um, I have a friend of mine who's a guitar player. So I came up with a design for a guitar divot tool. And then I took some of the hickory shafts that I had restored and made uh, divot tools out of them wrapping them the way you would a golf glove with uh, tartan. And the, the tool on the far right uh, in October of 2016, I popped it in an envelope to 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue with a note, Dear Barack, enclosed, please find a handcrafted divot tool that was made from the, a shaft from the 1920s. The tree that this came from was growing when President Lincoln was sitting in your chair. And here's another example of a hickory shaft. It is bored out and then hollowed so that you can put your golf, your, your pencil in and never lose your pencil and also brag about what courses you've played. Um, the President Cup and Ryder Cup tools have also changed over the years. In 2017, uh, Steve Stricker was the captain of the President's Cup team. It was held at Liberty National here in Bayonne. And so I designed a tool with a gold chalice inlaid into a field of bloodwood with uh, African mahogany on the back that allowed me to, to laser the players' names and logo on them. This past year, the Ryder Cup was held in Paris, France, and all of the players got these, this tool. Um, which I'm sure they didn't use, but they may now put a, flip it in the ground and stick their club on top of it. And this year, the, in December, the President's Cup will be at uh, Royal Melbourne, Bell, Melbourne, is that correct? A, in Sydney, Australia. So the prototype for that divot tool is this. So short of my, when my wife looks at me and I'm staring into space, she, a, thinks I lost my mind, but B, she realizes that I'm coming up with an idea for the next Divid tool. 
Um, this sheet of black felt was not big enough to hold all the different patterns that I've done over the years, but um, I'll try and continue to make more uh, and different ones. If I can backpedal just a little bit to my life as a carpenter, um, things were going along swimmingly. I was making divot tools and doing work, and then the recession came up and slapped us all in the back of the head. And I had about 18 months backlog of work. And then when that dried out, um, the phone stopped ringing. I had recently played a round of golf. And afterwards, the discussion came up about who the greatest golfer of all time was. Two young guys at the table, this is in 2009. 2000 guy, two, two of the young guys at the table said, Tiger Woods. Oh, yes, Tiger Woods. And I said, well, 14 majors. Now, 10 years later, he still has 14 majors. The other gentleman said, Jack Nicholas. he's got 18 majors and the length of his career and his accomplishments and everything. And I, I nodded and I said, well, that has some credence. And they said, who do you think it is? And I said, well, you really can't compare decades, but I would put Harry Varden in that list. And the two Tiger Woods acolytes both said, who's Harry Varden? And I said, well, when your history of golf doesn't predate 1993, it's easy to understand how you don't know who he was. I said he was, he won 47 events. He was from England. He won six Open Championships. He came to the United States three times, won the US Open once, and finished twice, two more times, all while battling tuberculosis and a class system that treated golf professionals as servants. I said, if he was around today, he would be an extremely wealthy superstar with courtesy cars and his own wheels up count. And uh, I said, but if these modern golfers had to go back in time and play hickory golf, there would be splinters of wood all over the place with their testosterone fueled 126 mile an hour club head speeds. So um, I decided to write a book about it, but I didn't want to do time travel. So I decided to have the clubs travel forward in time. So the book is about a young boy who's 13 in the late 1890s, and he receives a set of hickory clubs from old Tom Morris. And for those who don't know, Tom Morris is to Scottish golf what St. Patrick is to Irish road removal. He is, uh, he's the name. and. Uh, the clubs passed down through three more generations, and in 1962, the grandson of the first recipient takes them with him to watch the Open Championship at Troon. And he gets there, and there's an opening in the qualifier, and he plays the hickories and wins the qualifier, makes it into the Open Championship, and after 36 holes, he's the leader. He's paired with Arnold Palmer on the final day when they actually played 36 holes on the final day. And, um, if you want to find out what happens, you have to pick up this book. <laughs> Shameless self-promotion. <clears throat> um, but after I finished the book, um, my friend said, oh, Tim, you play hickory golf? And I said, of course I do. And so I ran out and bought myself a set of hickory clubs. And rather than take a chance with eBay purchase, I went to the authority on um, on Tom Stewart, who is the man. He, Tom Stewart was the club maker to the stars. Harry Varden, Ted Ray, Francis Wilmette, Bobby Jones, Walter Hagen. If you were anybody in any, of anybody uh, of knowledge, you went to Tom Stewart in Scotland and had your clubs made from him. He made clubs for a gentleman named Willie Kidd, who emigrated from Scotland, found his way to Minnesota, was the head pro, at Interlochen in 1930 when his friend Bobby Jones came up and uh, won the third leg of the Grand Slam. Um, so together with two other gentlemen, I formed, we formed the Metropolitan Hickory Society. And we continue to play about six events a year throughout the tri-state area at historic golf courses like Ridgewood and Yale and Hackensack and Baltus Roll. And, um, dressed in plus fours, shirt and tie, flat cap. We look completely out of place until you're all together. Um, 
And while we were at the first, one of the first events, a, a writer from Lynx Magazine named Tom Dunn came up and said, where'd you get those clubs? And I said, I got them from Ralph Livingston and I restored them. So he went to then editor of Lynx um, and aforementioned George Pepper and said, hey, can I write an article about Hickory Golf? And George said, no. He said, can I write an article about an accountant who became a carpenter who wrote a book who does Hickory Club restorations? And he went, okay, you can do that. So he did a one-page profile of me in the magazine, and two things happened as a result of that. Um, the first is what I call the antiques roadshow effect. I had people contacting me every day. Well, I found a club in my attic, basement, storage facility, grandfather's closet. How much is it worth? Well, can I trouble you to send me a picture? Oh, I don't really want to go through that much work, you know. So, and the other thing was people from all over started to send me clubs to restore. And I would take them and remove the head. And I have a head in the bag. The head is basically attached to the shaft with a small pin that's hammered through this hosel here. Um, you find that pin, you hammer it out, you pull the shaft out, then you can polish the head, strip the shaft, sand it, stain it, refinish it, and put it back into the club, hammer a pin in, peen it down, file it over, and then polish the head and put a new grip on it, and out it goes. Now there are people who say, oh, why did you ruin that good antique club? But when this club was made, that's what it looked like. It didn't go out, the, they didn't put rust on it and said, oh, leave it in the basement for 30 years and then we'll sell it for more money. Um, here's another example of two Stewart clubs. And you can see the name, Dias and Company, uh, Los Angeles. So Stewart would make these clubs and he would stamp the name of the person who was gonna receive them on the club the heads would go out, and the pro would put the shaft and the grip on the club. Um, Tom Stewart's shop put out between three and 5,000 heads a month in their heyday. And there were almost a million hickory shafts being produced in Tennessee and shipped mostly to the UK, but all over the world, Australia, India, uh, South America. Here's another example of a Cochrane Mashi. Um, the Harry C. Lee, New York, is, was a store here in the city that sold golf equipment, and the Shield Knight is the clique mark of um, Cochrane um, from Edinburgh. And here is one more example of some clubs that have been restored. Usually when you get the clubs, the woods, the whipping on the bottom, which is more like the one on the right, is either missing or it's held on with electrical tape or it's just all scrambled. Um, when I restore my clubs, I like to put what I call Scottish bling on the ends of the shafts and it's a little bit longer version of the whipping that covers the seam between the shaft and the head. And it looks more like an argyle sock and I think that if the Scots had colored uh, wax linen back in the day, they probably would have done that. And Golf clubs have been around for as long as golf. This is an example, a reproduction, of a long-nosed play club that would have been played from the 1500s till about, oh, I'd say the mid-1800s. And um, it has ram's horn on the bottom, held on by pegs. The, the, the first heads were usually made out of thornwood or holly um, before they got a hold of persimmon. The shafts were made out of um, hazel or green heart. And then in 1825, hickory found its way from Tennessee over to Scotland in the form of uh, ax handles, hammer handles, and supports for mine ceilings. And someone, some bright uh, coal miner probably said, hey, chop this up and you make a great hickory shaft, a great shaft for golf clubs. And so for the last, for the next 105 years or so, um, hickory was the shaft du jour of, uh, in the golf community. They played with wooden clubs like this because they used to play with a 
feathery golf ball. This is an example of a uh, golf ball by William Gourlay. He was kind of the, the golf ball maker of the, to the stars as well. This ball is basically a top and bottom dome of leather sewn to a horizontal rectangle. Um, they leave the one seam open, invert it so all the stitching is on the inside, then take this and set it into a, a pool of alum and water. And when the leather is soaked sufficiently, they take a top hat full of feathers, chicken and goose feathers, boil them in water, pinch your nose because they stink to high heaven, and then shove them into the golf ball and then blind stitch that up. And as the leather shrinks, it gets sm smaller. And as the feathers dry, they get bigger and leave you with a club with a ball that goes about 200 yards when you hit it with a club like this. It took a good feathery maker a whole day to make one of these. And it took a bad golfer one swing to make a pillow fight. Up until the, probably when, when this society was founded, um, clubs were made by uh, bow makers. They knew how to make long straight shafts for arrows. They knew how to shape wood to make the bows. And then about 1755, a, uh, a gentleman started to call himself club maker. And one of the best of the day was Hugh Philp, who was the Stradivarius of club makers. And I was lucky enough to not only see these, but take them out of the case and hold them. Um, they have a, almost a sensuous nature to them. They, they're all hand shaped and the sole plate, you can just see on the back a little strip of discoloration. The entire head, or I'd, I'd say 70% of it, is filled with lead to give the club weight. The sole plate is a piece of ram's horn that's soaked in hot water, straightened out, and fastened to a notched out piece of the sole of the club. And this protected the club from gravel and, and rocks that were beyond the ground. This club itself was basically about two-thirds the height of a golf ball. And that's a feathery. And so you, you had to be pretty accurate with your, with your swing to hit that. In Scotland, even today, the golf courses are open to the public. And back in the day, women would take wagons across the golf car course to the water to collect seaweed to make into fertilizer. They'd turn around with their cart burdened with seaweed and ride across the golf course and put ruts in the ground. And so the only metal club of the day was a thing called a rut iron or a track iron basically an ice cream scoop at the end of a, of a shaft. And you had to play the ball where it lies. So when the ball went in those tracks or the ruts of the carts, you extracted it with that. Here's a little history of the golf ball. The far left one is a feathery. That existed until the very first golf balls were wooden. And they were played until People got tired of breaking up wood, and then they invented the feathery, and that lasted a couple hundred years. And then the gutta percha ball, which is the next one, in 1848, people started to ship um, things, and they used the dried sap of a gutta tree from Malaysia. And it acted as almost like popcorn shells that you see today. Um, but they found out that if you put it in a pot of hot water, it gained the consistency of silly putty. And then you could take a small piece of it, shape it with your hands, it would harden up, and you could play golf with it. But when you first hit the ball, it would go wherever it wanted to. And only after you hit it a few hundred times and nicked it up did it start to fly straight. So they realized that the nicks on the ball resulted in the aerodynamics of the ball. And um, so the hand hammered and then machine shaped gutties came about. And then in nine, around 1900, late 1800s, a gentleman from the United States who was born in Boston and moved to Ohio um, named Coburn Haskell had a buddy named Bertram Work. And Bertram worked, work, worked 
at the BF Goodrich factory. He was, they were going to play golf one day and he went over to see him before the round and he noticed all these strands of rubber bands on the ground that were used to make the tires of the day. So he coiled a bunch of them up and dropped it on the ground and it bounced back up and he said, hmm, I covered this with a little gutta percha and by next year I'll be stirring a drink in the Bahamas with a cocktail straw. So the gutta percha ball gave way to the wound, to the bramble ball, which is the middle one. Um, the dimples that stick out, uh, that was the Varden flyer. And Harry Varden came over in 1900 and made a boatload of money traveling around the United States playing exhibition matches and promoting that golf ball for A.G. Spaulding. Um, the next two balls are basically um, just dip different dimple patterns on the golf ball that the, the one after the far right was then the shallow dimple ball, which is the precursor to the golf ball that we see today. Um, once the gutta percha ball came into play, people didn't really need these anymore. And um, so they started to make cliques. And a clique is basically like a long putter. It had maybe 10 to 12 degrees of loft on it. And here's an example of a putting clique. It was a putter, but it also had about 12 degrees of loft. And people would use that from the fringe to get the ball over the fringe and running down the grass. Um, once they did the clique, they decided to also do a niblick, which is a pitching wedge, then a mashie or a lofter, which is a, somewhere in the middle. Then they filled all those lofts with different names like a Sammy, a Benny, a mongrel clique, a mashie clique, a mashie iron, a mashie niblick, a spade mashie. There's, and they had to look and say, oh, there's my spade mashie. They didn't have numbers on the top the way we do today. Um, early clubs had grips that were made out of lambskin, um, sheepskin um, over a, an under wrap of material that looked like pajamas. And I'm sure there were more than their share of women who said, uh, Malcolm, where's my nightgown? And, and he looked shamelessly at the ground. Um, when I restore clubs now, I use different color leathers. And people ask me why I do it. And I've probably restored over a 1,000 clubs. And I'd say about five or 600 of them when you take them off, the outer grip is black. And they used to use pitch or pine tar the way be baseball players do. And when you undo the grip, they would be brown, blue, purple, pink, all different colors. There's a few examples of some before and afters of clubs that I've restored. A wood on the left, a flange niblick on the right. This is a... Uh, a brassy. The brassies were just called that because of the brass plate on the bottom. They were probably between a two and a three wood, you would see, of modern day loft. Here is a, uh, a four iron and a mashie. Alex Smith was one of the Smith brothers, McDonald Smith. Hmm, I'm not sure what the other brothers' names were, but they all came to the United States, and only one of them didn't win the U.S. Open. The club on the left has an L above the number four, signifying it was a ladies' club. And here's a club that I would prefer to play the one on the top, and golf collectors would prefer to hold the one on the bottom because it's a beautiful rust on it. Um, here's a series of putters, both gunmetal brass and steel. As you go halfway up the page, there's some aluminum-headed putters and then some various irons going down the end. These are some, uh, the, the clubs go driver, brassy, spoon, baffy, clique. Down the line, the heads keep getting smaller and smaller, the lofts get a little bit bigger. These are probably spoons um, with a variety of golf balls in front of them. The balls don't necessarily uh, correlate to the club that's in behind it. But you can see another example of my Scottish bling on that. 
Um, I got a club sent to me with a fancy face insert. They were always afraid that the wood would get damaged, especially from the ball, second from the right, the bramble ball. That, that hits the club face and causes little dents in the, in, so people would take out, cut out that dent and fill it with leather, or they would fill it with um, vulcanite, which is a very hard plastic. So I got this club and it had a red, white, and black uh, insert, so I matched the whipping so that it would look like that. And then here's another example of um, two clubs I restored and the uh, Scottish bling that I put on it. When cleeks started to be made, the, when iron started to be made, like the rut iron, they were made by blacksmiths who took a time off from making horseshoes and said, oh yeah, I can do that for you. They didn't have a whole lot of business because people played feathery golf balls. Then when they started to make cliques and niblicks and everything, they gave up their four-legged customers for two-legged customers and made some money. And they um, also took pride in their work. Every club that I've restored underneath the grip, it has um, restored by T. Alpaw, the date, and a signature. So that 200 years from now, Hopefully, when someone takes one of these apart, they'll say, oh, look at me. Who wrote, who wrote in my golf club? Um, so the, the club makers wanted to let people know who made the club. So they came up with their, a, a stamp that would go on the back of the club called a clique mark. And the pipe and the snake are Tom Stewart. The snake was generally for women's or juvenile clubs. The shield, the knight, and the rope were um, Cochrane. The S and the G was Spence and Gourlay. Um, the moon and star is uh, Gourlay. The mitered helmet is uh, Hendry and Bishop. The hand on the bottom right is George Nickel. So they took such pride in that they would actually put their name on the back and stamp it. They would stamp the name of the person who was going to receive it or the pro who was going to get it. And by seeing those, you could literally tell the history of a golf club. So here we have an example of a Spence and Gourlay club that when they, they were partnered up until the end of the First World War. So this was probably a leftover. He sold his business to Robert Forgan and probably found the club and had the clique mark on it and said, here, take this. It's got my clique mark. I don't care. Robert Forgan then put his initials on it, and then on the top you can see the crown. He made the clubs for the King of England. So when you did that, you were able to put the crown. Before that, you put a fleur-de-lis when he was the prince. Um, it was sold to uh, Shaler Company, the OS is Shaler Company in, Wis in Wisconsin, who sold it then to Taplow, which is John Wanamaker. So the whole history of this golf club is revealed on the back. When I was at the USGA Golf Museum, I walked in and they had all of Francis with Matt clubs like this. And I said, turn them around so that you can see who made the club, what kind of club it is. And they said, oh, the gentleman told us that a few years ago. And uh, that was Ralph Livingston who ended up selling me all my Stewart clubs. So if I can go back to that round at the old course at St. Andrews, on the third hole, I was walking off the green, and one of the marshals came up and started looking through my golf bag. And I said, like every annoying American, hey, can I help you? And he turned around and he said, my great-great-grandfather was James Spence. He was a club maker. And I said, I know who he was. He was partnered with George Gourlay, and their, their clique mark was an S an ampersand and a G inside of a clover. I said, and then he, they broke up after the First World War and he changed his clique mark to a flag stick and a pin, then sold his business to Robert Forgan who kept his clique mark. And he stood there and went, and he said, laddie, the only thing better than a hickory golfer is an educated hickory golfer. So we walked a few holes and he said, I've got to get back to my post. And I said to him, I have one of your great-great-grandfather's golf clubs, and I'll bring it back with me on my next visit. And it was almost like my mother used to say, mark it on the ice, like a promise that wouldn't be kept. And he just smiled and said, sure, that'd be great. 
So my daughter was getting a master's degree at the London School of Economics, and during spring break, uh, we took a trip to Edinburgh by train, and then I played Gullen, Muirfield, North Berwick, Cruden Bay, Dornick, Brora, Kingarrick, and the Old Course, all with seven hickory clubs. And it was after my final round at the Old Course, I went into the visitor center, and I said, do you have a gentleman related to uh, James Spence, who works here. And they said, uh, Alex Spence. I said, is he in? And they said, just a minute. And they picked up the walkie-talkie and said, Alec, please report to the visitor center. There's a man from America here. And he walked in like he had hit my car in the parking lot. And I said, I'm sure you don't remember me, but um, you told me you were related to James Spence. And he said, aye. So I said, I want to give you this. And I reached in and I gave him a completely restored Hickory Golf Club. And he turned it around, and on the bottom of the heel, it says James Spence, St. Andrews. Waterworks, he's crying. I can't talk, he can't talk. People are clapping. And I said, um, can I get a picture of you with the club? So we went out to the first tee, and there's four golfers there, and three caddies, and the starter, and he says, JJ, can we have the box? And JJ turns and says, gentlemen, please exit the tea box. And they're looking at us like, hey, we have a tea time. What are the two of you going to share that one club? And he turned with his back to the old course clubhouse. So. And that is pretty much all the reason why you do this. <laughs> and just, just as the artisans who founded the society um, passed on their knowledge to the um, journeymen and the apprentices, so too through demonstrations and lectures and uh, articles I've written, do I try to pass on what knowledge I have to those people who are willing to work with their heads and their hands and their heart. Thank you. Please, not any hard ones. <clears throat> Why did they come to prefer the hickory from America? What was it about the hickory that was preferable to what they had been using? The springiness of it, the resilience. It's a very fibrous wood. Um, it, it can take a lot of torque and not break. And if it's... Um, if it's taken from the right part of the tree and dried properly, it keeps its straightness for 100 years. I have clubs that are straight as an arrow today. So before that, they used um, green heart, which is related to the purple heart. They used um, hazel, which they used to use for broom handles and things like that. But um, I think the moisture often affected those clubs, and they, they got bends in them that could be straightened out, but. You didn't want to take three days off and go grab your club and look down and see a hockey stick. So that's why they switched to Hickory. Tim, uh, thank you so much, but more about, about that later. Where did you learn your carpentry skills, or did it just come naturally? <laughs> it's funny because when, when, when you would do like um, coffered ceiling or a raised panel wall, people go, how did you learn how to do that? And I would say, well, it's not like rocket science. And then people would, it's the old joke about people would say to rocket scientists, how do you know how to do rocket science? And they would say, well, it's not like talking to girls or anything, you know. <laughs> so it just, it came to me. It's just one of those things that you see it done and you can do it yourself. So it wasn't book learned or anything like that. Two things. Uh, do you, you don't have pictures of your workshop. Yeah, my wife won't let there's poison snakes and animals running around and it's, some people have seen it. Um, some people have gone down there and never come back. Um, it's, uh, it's dust covered. It looks used. It looks like the shop of somebody who still has all their fingers. 
Also, some of the, the clubs don't have pins in them, that they're just to the chef. They're not, the, the heads aren't, uh, they're just like, they look like they have lines in them to hold them to the shaft. The early clubs, when they would make um, rut irons, before they started to pin them, they would put almost a zigzag top on it, put the shaft in and then crimp those in and they would clinch onto the shafts. Um, and then somebody bright enough said, why don't you just put a pin across it? So that way, I'm sure after he got back from the, uh, the doctor with a big bump on his head from the hat and the, the head coming off, uh, he probably said, let's so do that. Those were the earlier ones. The, early, the very early irons were fastened just by crimping the top of the hosel. Mm -hmm. They would cut it or file it like a saw blade and had jagged teeth on it, and they would crimp those in right. to the And to the, the shop. ones that you do with the, the Scottish bling, you said, they, they're pinned underneath. They are not. Th those are, um, the head comes up. The head comes up about this height, and then there's a hole board through this hosel piece, and it comes out the bottom. So the shaft is tapered, put into that hole with horse-eyed glue, and then a lot of times they would put the brass plate on and put that screw in so that the, that screw would go into the bottom of the shaft and anchor it so the other screws in the plate would hold that intact. Yes, yes. Um, so, so Tim, obviously I've seen you play with them, but for the golfers here, um, how does your swing change playing hickories versus modern it be, day clubs? It becomes beautiful. It becomes like Steve Elkington or Larry Mize or Ernie Els. When people see you swing, they say, first they, when the ball hits one of the hickory clubs, it makes this little click sound. It's kind of like going to a high school baseball game and some kid comes out with a wooden bat and everybody turns because he hit the ball but they didn't hear that bonk sound. And then they see you swing. You generally swing about 80% of the speed of your steel swing. And then when you go back to steel, your first few swings are smooth and, and syrupy, and the ball just goes forever. And then all of a sudden, the testosterone kicks in, and you try to hit it harder, and you squeeze the club harder, and your forearms get all, and your veins in your neck, and your game is lost until you get back to a set of hickories. Yes. Uh, so you said you, you sent uh, uh, the divot tool to President Obama. Did yes. he reply? Yes, I got a thank you note from him. In fact, when my daughters were in elementary school, um, they brought a thank you note from President Clinton to show and tell. Dear Tim, thank you for the divot tool. Hillary and I pass on best wishes to you and your family. And uh, it was almost as nice as the letters that I used to get from Arnold Palmer. So, <laughs> Tim, on average, how long does it take to create a divot repair tool and restore a club? And has there been one of either that has taken you a significant amount of time longer than usual? The divot tools, the, the concept of divot tools jump in your head from everywhere. Um, and a lot of times they're, they source out of frustration, like the one, the single prong coming out of the broken two prong. Um, the multi-layered ones, you basically take a template, you cut out the core, then you put that core onto uh, a piece of Purple Heart or Bubinga, and you cut those two pieces out, and then it's all glued together and put aside. When that's all done, you take it out and you shape it. I have a, a four by 36 inch belt sander that I use to shape it and trim my fingernails at the same time. And, um, then it goes through four layers of hand sanding in like 100 grid, 150, 180, 320, and then it's got a, a little coat of orange oil on it. So um, there's a gentleman up in Canada who I sent some divot tools to who makes these clubs, and he's, he's such a skilled craftsman. So I sent him some divot tools in exchange for some golf clubs, and he... Uh, he said, I'm gonna to try to make one of those divot tools. So the next day he called me and he said, which one did you make and which one did I make? And he showed me, it's like, which one of these is your child and which one is the one we found at the grocery store? And I said, oh, mine's the one on the, how did you know that? And, 
And I said, how long did it take you? And he said, four and a half hours. And I said, well, I can make about 60 or 70 of them in a day. And he said, okay, I'll go back to making my long nose play clubs. But the, the clubs themselves, the irons are pretty quick and easy. You, you pop the pin out, you take the head off, you polish the head, um, you put it, you take the shaft and you take a um, utility knife and you hold it on its side 90 degrees to the wood and use it as a scraper and that takes off all the shellac and everything. Then you restain it, you sand it, stain it, sign it, um, put four coats of polyurethane on it. So it's a, a lengthy process but it's like two hours of wait between each coat. Then you put the grip on and um, as a gentleman up in Vermont and he did a YouTube video on how to grip a golf club. And it was a three-part video, 15, 18, and 17 minutes. And I can usually do a, a club for every song I listen to on iTunes. So he's, uh, his speed will go up with the more that he does. But uh, um, the woods are tougher because you, you don't want to take off the stamping on the top of the wood that has the maker's name or the golf course that it was sent to. You don't want to try and do any of the, remove any of the grooves in the face. Um, so you gently scrape that off. You don't want to sand the lead because then you got lead dust going up in the air. So they take a little more time. And then you tape the face, you tape the lead, you tape the sole plate. And then you stain the head a different color than the shaft. And then you let it dry for a day and then get on with the polyurethane. So um, it's a time consuming process. And when people call and say, how much is it to do my grandfather's club? And you tell them, they go, oh. Like, and then you say, I do this, I do that. And you get to like the 10th thing and they go, oh, we're good, we're good. And I'll pop it in the mail tomorrow. So. Last question. Anyone? Um, as a historian of the game, I'm just a little curious, kind of bringing it to today, uh, what's your view on the modern golf ball um, and kind of how that affects the amateur and professional game? There are, are, there's an article by a gentleman named Max Baer, who was a member of Morris County in Somerset Hills. In 1904, he wrote, um, the golf ball has gotten out of hand. Golf clubs will soon become obsolete. And nobody listened, nobody's listening today. And until they finally come up and say, like they limited the size of a golf club to 460 cc's, if they didn't come in and do that, there'd be golf club heads the size of that piano that people would be lifting up and saying, look how far I can hit the ball. Um, until they do that with the golf ball, or until somebody like the Masters finally says, here's the ball we're gonna play our tournament with, it's got a limited flight or it's, you know, from 1996. Nothing's going to change, unfortunately. So. Anyone else? Yes. Yes. Oh, it's incredibly eclectic. It's from classic to Steely Dan, to James Taylor, to um, Crosby, Stills, Nash, anything. I just go down and hit it, country music. And uh, you know what's coming up. And you know sometimes to skip that because you want to do something quickly. Um, but yeah, very eclectic. Thank you. On behalf of the General Society, I'd like you to thank you so much for sharing your expertise, your enthusiasm, your knowledge, and your creativity. Thank it really, to, see, to, to be able to see your work, at, both at, on, for, at first hand, was you know, an absolute delight. And we're all so pleased that you could be here to share your experiences and expertise. So thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you. Um, On occasions like this, 
when we have a wonderful artisan present, we would like to make a presentation to you. So, and to do so is our executive director, Victoria Dangle. Thank you. So, Tim, to add to Karen's comments, thank you so much. That was so lovely and so inspiring. I have to say, um, you've converted me. I had zero interest in golf. And after today, <laughs> I really have a lot of interest, so thank you. It's a beautiful game. Uh, you, when I see the love you have for what you do and, and the passion, it really, you give another life you know, to, to, to those golf clubs. And, um, and you said that what distinguishes um, someone is have, uh, in terms of the heart of the artist. And well, for you to get so emotional over Mr. Spence, and that was really a very lovely gesture and uh, really unforgettable. So uh, that was beautiful. So thank you for sharing that with us. Thank you. And one other thing I have to observe, you have no reason to be nervous. You're a fabulous speaker, so please. <laughs> Not at all. You really are. That was so thoughtfully put together. Thank you. It was really very beautiful. So on behalf of the General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen, founded 1785, with the motto, by hammer in hand, all arts do stand, we express our gratitude to Tim Alpau, artisan, for the restoration of Hickory Golf Clubs and the crafting of divot tools for his participation in the General Society Artisan Lecture Series. So thank you so much, Tim. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's take a picture. Thank you so much. Oh, you're very welcome. But because, as many of you know who regularly come, when, we, when you've lectured here and we really like you, we never let you go. So we have made Tim a lifetime member of the library. <laughs> come back. 